Good morning. Hello. Thank you for joining us today for the RTA's webinar on tenancy law changes for minimum housing standards and also rent increase frequency changes. Before we do start, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are meeting today and where you are joining us as well and pay our respects to owners, elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm a Senior Community Education Officer with the RTA. And with me today to help out with this session, I have my colleague, Sam Gaylor. Morning. And also out behind the scenes, we have Mark Fiddler. Morning all. Thanks, Lynn. For today's session, I will recap the rental reforms and the existing tenancy laws that support minimum housing standards. So they were already in place. I will also advise what the regulations state regarding minimum housing standards and will answer the commonly asked questions that we have been receiving. We'll also touch on the rent increase frequency changes that came into effect as of 1 July. So remember the role of the RTA is to administer the Queensland Tenancy Laws, which is the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act 2008. Well, we don't make the rules. Our role is to help you and everyone involved in the rental sector understand their rights and obligations under the Tenancy Laws. Now, I do acknowledge that <clears throat> our audience today is a mix of landlords, agents, property managers, community groups and tenants. And I thank you for your time to attend. But we do have a considerable amount of people that have registered for today. Um, so our aim is to cover off on the information and questions around these two topics. Um, if you do want to ask a question, please use the chat function in the Zoom um, on your toolbar. Um, for the Q&A session, I am conscious of your time and again with the high volume of attendees that we have now, um, not to run over time. So Sam and Mark will be monitoring the questions and look out for any duplications or themed questions that we get through. So we will also cover um, common questions that we receive um, or when we do cover the common questions that we are receiving, you may find that your answer um, to your question might be covered in that section. So we'll also be putting some links for some information into the chat, so please keep an eye out for that as well. And for information delivered today, it's current at this point in time, and for general guidance only, we cannot provide you with legal advice, and for more information, you should always refer to the Act. So just a bit of a quick history on the rental reforms and how we got here. So this kicked off as part of a consultation back in 2018 to 19, which was the Queensland Government's Open Doors to Renting Reforms consultation. So the Queensland Government received over 137,000 responses from tenants, owners, property managers and other people in the rental sector. That was part of that consultation stage. The Housing Legislation Amendment Act 2021 was passed in October 21 and was implemented in a staged approach. So the first of the stages is the was the domestic and family violence provisions. So that came into effect October 21. Then last year in October 22, the framework for negotiating rental with pets, changes for the reasons to ending a tenancy, repair orders and some other amendments were introduced. Now, a lot of information is available on the RTA's website and a whole pile of resources as well in relation to those changes last year. The final part of stage one is what we're dealing with today, and that's the minimum housing standards. So as of 1 September 23, minimum housing standards starts for new tenancies and for all tenancies the following year. <clears throat> So I'm just going to quickly go over some of the amendments that started in October 2022 and are already in place to support the minimum housing standards. So more in-depth information on these points you'll find on our website. So for emergency repairs, this is where a tenant can organise an emergency repair if they are unable to contact the owner or the agent or their nominated repairer. This was changed to be up to four weeks rent equivalent whereas previously it was two weeks rent equivalent. Property managers can authorise emergency repairs on behalf of their owner client up to four weeks rent and take that from the rent collected before they disperse the funds. A nominated repairer must be listed on the tenancy agreement, whereas before it said it may be listed. So let's face it, emergencies usually occur after hours, not during hours, so it's really important that a tenant knows who to contact if there is an emergency repair. 
There's also a requirement for landlords or agents to disclose any outstanding repair orders to prospective tenants on the tenancy agreement. Repair orders came into effect last year and do have a fact sheet um, and video resource on that particular topic. So what is an emergency repair is outlined under section 214 of the legislation. An additional section has been added to include works that's required to comply with prescribed minimum housing standards, which I'll talk about that shortly. A tenant can also end a tenancy within seven days of occupancy if the premises are not in good condition. And as of 1 September, if the premises don't meet minimum housing standards. Tenants would need to give 14 days notice to the landlord or the agent. But if there is a dispute over the condition, either party can lodge a dispute resolution request with the RTA and the, our conciliators can assist. I mentioned in the previous slide repair orders so repair orders add an additional pathway for tenants to have repairs carried out. And a tenant can apply to the tribunal for an, or, for an order on urgent or non-urgent repairs, and a copy of that order is sent to the RTA. It's really important to note that a repair order is attached to the rental property, and should there be a change of owners or a change of the property managers, then the order will continue until it is complied with. So when the tribunal makes an order, it considers the conduct of the owner and the agent, uh, risk of injury, loss of amenity. So the repair order directions <clears throat> may include what is to be repaired and by when. It could also be a reduction in rent or amount of compensation until the repair is done, um, or that the agreement will end if the repairs are not done by a certain date. So it also can be that the property is not to be relet, relet until the property um, until those repairs have been done as well. So if you are an owner or managing agent and you do require more time to get a repair order done, you can seek an extension of time, but you need to do that prior to the QCAT order expiring. There are penalty provisions under the tense law to contravene a repair order. So let's have a look at why we're here today, and that is about the minimum housing standards as well as the changes to the rent increases. So let's start with minimum housing standards first. Um, these will start from 1 September 2023 for new tenancies. So this is where you have a new tenancy agreement or rooming agreement that's being signed or a renewal agreement being signed. And for all tenancies, it will commence next year from 1 September 2024. So rental properties need to be safe. They need to be secure and have reasonable functionality. So let's step through what safe and secure means first. Firstly, it is about the weatherproof and structurally sound. The roof and windows to prevent water entering, the floors, walls, ceiling, roof, deck, stairs are not likely to collapse due to rot or a defect. And as well, you've got the supporting structure is not affected by significant dampness and the property condition is not likely to cause damage to the occupant's personal property. Fixtures and fittings need to be in good repair and not likely to cause injury. This does include if there's any electrical appliances that's included in the property, so whether the property might be furnished or maybe semi-furnished. The property needs to be free of vermin, damp and mould. This obligation does not apply if the vermin, damp or mould is caused by the tenant. Now, I know that we do have quite a lot of questions about mould um, and there is information on our website in relation to that topic. Because remember, it's about it's important to know how the mould got there and that can actually help guide on who is actually responsible for that. In relation to locks on windows and doors, it's very clear that the legislation states a functioning lock or latch is fitted to all external windows and doors to secure the premises against unauthorised entry. This does apply to windows and doors. This applies to windows and doors that do not require a ladder to access. And clearly the purpose here is to ensure the premises are secure. So every property does need to be assessed on a case by case basis. So not every property is going to be the same. And remember, this is the minimum standard. So what we're looking at here is minimum is a functioning lock or minimum a functioning latch is fitted to all those external windows and doors. We will talk about um, some of the common questions that we are receiving. We'll get to those shortly, um, which probably will answer a lot of the questions that are coming through now through the chat. 
In relation to privacy coverings, windows in all rooms, which the tenant reasonably expects privacy. So this, we are talking about like bedrooms, we're talking about bathrooms. Um, this would require the privacy coverings, could be a curtain, blind tinting, or glass frosting. And this doesn't apply if the window is obstructed by a fence, a hedge tree, or any other feature. Now the premises, and when we talk about reasonable functionality, the premises must have adequate plumbing and drainage for the number of persons occupying the premises and be connected to a water supply service or infrastructure supplying hot and cold water suitable for drinking. The bathroom and toilet facilities must provide privacy and function as design. They must be connected to a sewer, septic or other waste disposal system. And if included, the kitchen must include a functioning cooktop and the laundry must include fixtures required to provide a functional laundry. Now, I just wanna to also touch base here in relation to properties that are within a body corporate. So this is where we are talking about the units, your townhouses, your apartment complexes. So just keep in mind, some of the complexes are gonna have bylaws around the color or type of window coverings. So as an example, it might be that the curtains or blinds have to have a white backing or something like that. For repairs, again, checking whether or not it's the owner's responsibility or whether it could potentially fall to the body corporate. So some examples might be that roof and external walls and even some internal piping might fall to the body corporate for repair rather than the owner. So you need to look at the timeframes that a body corporate or the committee members may need to action those repairs and maintenance um, and whether or not the repair actually falls within their cost limits at the time or whether they may need to take further action. So the RTA has collaborated with the Body Corporate Commissioner's Office and we have done a short webinar that is available on our website on this particular topic. So if you happen to rent, manage or own a unit in a um, townhouse or a townhouse, then I'd recommend watching that short video. Now, Sam, I'm going to get you to come online and we are going to go through the very common questions that we have been um, getting asked, um, particularly over the last couple of months. So, <clears throat> Sam, do I have to do deadlocks and window locks? No problem. Um, so, the legislation doesn't stipulate uh, deadlocks. It does say that there needs to be a lock uh, and on the window there needs to be a functioning lock or a latch. Um, that may be property specific. If you want to put a deadlock on, you can, but there's nothing requiring you to. Yeah, and again, it's about that case by case situation and again, reasonable security hmm. for that individual property. If I have security screens, do I still need to add a lock or latch? Uh, so the legislation still does stipulate lock or a latch depending on the security screen it may not be too big an issue from a, a security perspective but the window uh, does still need to be locked or latched and so does the door now what happens if the tenant has their own curtains yeah um, so the tenant can have their own curtains they can put their own curtains up if there was any sort of window covering there before then when the tenant leaves, they need to return it in as close to the original condition as possible. When they first moved in, I'd recommend uh, probably getting any kind of agreement there in writing. And do I have to engage a third party professional to ensure my property complies with the standards? Yeah, so there's a few uh, questions coming through around this. So this hopefully will, uh, will help cover that. Um, there's nothing in the legislation that says a third party professional needs to be engaged. It just says what the standards are, not how you get it there. Obviously, if it's a, a lock on the door, it's probably not going to need um, you know, anything particularly uh, you know, complex there. But if you have any concerns or you think there might be concerns with rot or uh, defects in the roof, then obviously we recommend getting someone who knows about those things. Same for electrical. What happens if I do not comply with a repair order or I need more time? Yeah, so there's a, a range of things that can happen if you don't comply with a repair order, uh, ranging from the property not being able to be relet, um, tenant potentially leaving possible penalties. Uh, if you do need more time, uh, you can apply for more time, but you should do so before the order expires. So apply to QCAT. And also if my lease is periodic, when does this start? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. So this is for uh, minimum housing standards is for um, new or renewed agreements at this stage and then for all agreements uh, from September 1st, 2024. 
Great. Now I know that I have quickly just glanced at the chat as well. There is questions about mould. So I'll just quickly touch on that and going that you really need to come down to looking at how the mould got there. So if we are talking about a roof that is um, leaking and there's mould on the ceiling, well then clearly that would be going back to the owner to rectify. If we are talking about mould in the bathroom because um, the tent might not have used the exhaust fan or open up the window for ventilation and things like that, well then that may then obviously fall to the tenant to rectify. We know that some areas that are a bit grey sometimes can fall into when it's the environmental concerns, um, you know, with wet weather and things like that. So it's no one's fault, no tenant, no owner fault. And in those situations, we recommend both the owner and the tenant working together to try and get the matter resolved. So there is more information on our website on mould, um, but we'll just keep moving on because I'm just, again, conscious of time here with everyone asking a lot of questions, which we will get to at the end. And hopefully Mark can actually um, de-dupe some of the same questions that's coming through as well. Let's have a talk about rent increases from that change. So this is the frequency part that's changing from six months to 12 months and came into effect as of 1 July. So in April, Queensland Parliament passed legislation to limit the rent increase frequency to be no more than once every 12 months. So this amendment was part of the Local Government Electoral and Other Legislation Amendment Bill. So these amendments do bring Queensland into line with other Australian jurisdictions. So it doesn't limit the rent increase amount. And previously the Act stated rent increases was not less than six months. So from 1 July, that rent increase frequency is now to be not less than 12 months. So it does apply to existing and new tenancies from 1 July. Um, the changes are retrospective, meaning that if you have an an existing lease with an increase coming up and it says it's six months, then that will not be lawful. The increase will need to be 12 months. The 12 month minimum period applies where at least one tenant's right to occupy the property, property continues and whether or not there has been a change of property owner or property manager. So again, reminder that the 12 months does not always equal 52 weeks. So if you get your calendar out, you will find 52 weeks is 52 weeks and 12 months. We talk to the Acts Interpretation Act in that and then a month is actually a calendar month. So be very mindful of that when you are looking at your increases. Um, notice periods still do apply um, when you are looking to rent, increase the rent as well. So to get a better understanding of the increase, I've put two scenarios here. Uh, if you've got an agreement that started in March 23, uh, the rent is scheduled to increase with a renewal agreement in September 23, and all the tenants are continuing, then the rent increase would be ineffective. You could not increase the rent until March 2024. If you have a 12 month agreement that started say in April this year, has a special term with a rent increase that was due in October, Again, this increase would be ineffective in you could not increase the rent until April 2024. So the legislation remains the same when it comes to a tenant wishing to dispute a proposed rent increase if they feel it is excessive. So a tenant can make an application to the tribunal, which is the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal for an order. Um, there is a process to follow and some timeframes. So um, a tenant would need to go through the RTA's free dispute dispute resolution service first and must make the application within 30 days of receiving the increased notification. So if it does progress to QCAT, um, an adjudicator can consider a whole range of areas and that may be the range of market rents usually charged for this type of property, um, state of the property uh, or the repair, the term of the tenancy, uh, the proposed increase amount um, and it could be anything else that the tribunal considers at the time. So we do publish median rent data and I might get Mark just to put a link in our chat. Um, if you ever wanna know what your median rent is for like one, two or three bedroom units or two, three, four bedroom houses in your individual postcode in your area, then you, we do publish this every quarter. So you'll be able to find that on the RTA's website. Okay, so just going over some questions, Sam, I'll get you to come back online. And these are sort of the types of questions that we have been getting asked um, throughout our face-to-face -face sessions and also in our call centre as well. 
So first one, Sam, what happens if I've already signed a new lease and it's now not compliant? Yep, uh, no worries. So we would uh, suggest that the agreement be redone. Um, agents and owners obviously to talk with tenants um, and inform them of, uh, of that. Um, the rent amount will not be able to be the increased amount because it's not compliant. Um, if there's an issue where the tenant doesn't re-sign it or something, it's probably just as simple as uh, a letter uh, or an email stating that the rent amount uh, will not be coming into effect. Okay, what happens if the tenant doesn't sign the amended lease? Yeah, so um, it's, that's basically the, the scenario that we talked about. Um, you know, if they don't sign it, it doesn't mean that the lease isn't valid. Um, but it's just about making sure you've got clear communication. So it can just be an email to the tenant advising that that rent amount won't uh, won't apply, but the lease is still valid. And what happens if I have a special term in the lease already signed, but now that's not going to be compliant? Yeah, again, uh, if that term is not going to be valid, uh, recommend writing to the tenants just to make sure that it, it's clear and that you've got a record of that. Now, can I swap around tenants' names or approved occupants and so that I can increase the rent under the 12 months? So this is one thing that we are seeing people try to do. Um, so as an example, if you've got like a husband and wife, only the husband's name on the lease and they go, oh, we'll just change it over to be the wife on the lease or we change it over and put the children's names on the lease rather than the parents' names. Yeah, so I mean, it's not unusual when legislation is changed for people to try and uh, and work it so that they can you know have it to their um, best situation. Um, but if you're swapping around the tenants' names in in that kind of way, then you're probably being seen to be evading the act. Um, and so the short answer to that is no, no, you can't do that. So there's penalty provisions, isn't it, for yeah, evading? Absolutely, it, it the is act. an offence. It can be investigated. Um, we would recommend, uh, obviously, welcome to call through to our contact centre and, and have a discussion. Um, but the short answer with that is don't do that. In the lease break situation, can I increase the rent and advertise it higher if it's still under the 12 months? Mm. So as of right now, um, yes, you can. You need to be very mindful in a, a lease break situation that if you're increasing the rent, um, that it's still uh, likely to be seen as reasonable. You've got a duty to mitigate loss, which is a requirement to keep your financial losses as small as possible. So you don't want to be seen as trying to put off um, prospective tenants. You're just looking at trying to get market value, for instance. Um, that situation is one of the ones that uh, potentially changes with the, um, the proposed changes to the rent increases which I'll get to that shortly. And look, we know too that we have some community providers in our audience today and they do reviews on like Centrelink or pension payments and things like that to um, have their rent increases um, amended accordingly and most likely they do that every six months. So just to put it out there too that we know that some of the community housing providers or NRAS providers are subject to these changes and they were not excluded. However, if you had an exemption under the Act under section 93.6, um, then those exemptions would still continue. But we do know that some of the community housing providers are also captured with this 12 months. So just something to be mindful of there. Okay, as you mentioned before, Sam, too, um, just an update for everyone. As of the 12th of July, the Queensland Government announced a consultation on the rent increase frequency on the objective of the reform and to ensure the annual rent increase limit operates effectively and helps stabilise the rent in the private rental market. Now, the Queensland Government is seeking your feedback. Um, so feedback from tenants, agents, landlords, the community sector, Regarding the proposal is to attach the rent increase frequency to the property rather than individual tenancies. So there is a discussion paper available um, and I'll get Mark to also probably put the link in our chat as well. This has been released by the government and again, this is your opportunity to have your say. The consultation is open between now and the 11th of August. While there has been reports of landlords doing multiple different things in relation to the 12 monthly frequency. Um, the housing minister, which is Minister Megan Scanlon, has said that you know, she's met with stakeholders and proposed tying the rent increases to the properties 
rather than the tenancies. And she just wants to ensure that the original intent of the laws are being respected. So this is your this is your opportunity to have your say as part of this consultation. So again, it's open between now and the 11th of August. So just before we get to all the questions, which I know we have a lot of questions coming through, just touch on the um, previous changes that are in effect um, as of now. So the 1 October 2021 provisions, the domestic and family violence provisions, there's many steps and forms and timeframes involved in this particular process. So we do have an easy to follow flow chart that's available for both tenants and landlords and agents that's on our website and we welcome you to download that um, and keep that um, as a tool um, if you need if you are in that situation to know what to do. From 1 October 2022, that was last year, the main changes were coming through for ending tenancies. This is the removal of the without grounds provision and new reasons to end a tenancy were introduced. The framework for negotiating renting with a pet. So all the forms, the requests of the forms and the response forms are available on our website. Uh, repair orders, um, which I touched on earlier and some other amendments. So again, our website does have a lot of information on the past changes as well as our upcoming changes. So we've got webinars, videos, podcasts, fact sheets, frequently asked questions and a lot more and please go to our website for that information. So before we go to your questions, just the other announcement that was made by the Queensland Government. So many of you would be aware of the announcement of stage two of the rental reforms. Uh, the government pro produced an options paper and did seek feedback from the rental sector. That consultation closed on the 29th of May, 2023. There were five key legislative reform priorities that was listed in that options paper, and they included installing modifications, making personalisation changes, balancing privacy and access, improving the rental bond process and fairer fees and charges. So remember, this is not law as we have it as of today. This was a consultation and it's only just closed. So this is now back to the Department of Housing to review the feedback. It's received from everybody in the rental sector. So hopefully <clears throat> once we know more, we will be letting you know more. So hopefully you've had your opportunity to have your say. And as I said, it's not law now. Um, we can't answer any questions on this. Um, but once we do know more, we can let you know. Okay, Mark, over to you and Sam to pop in for me and just have a look through. I know that there is a lot of questions that's come through. So I'll leave it to you and Sam just to um, go through them. Thanks, Lynn, um, and thanks very much for the questions that have come through. We have addressed uh, a number of them, community housing, rent increases, um, some of the body corporate issues. There is one question here, Sam, in relation to vermin, does this rule out that the tenants are required to keep the property pest free? Okay, um, look, good question. Um, so the, the legislation doesn't say specifically that the tenants required to keep the property pest free. I mean, you can say, obviously, they're not, they're able to cause vermin. The tenant is required to keep the property clean. Um, and ultimately, with, if there's pests or if the property is not being kept clean, um, then that is a breach. Fantastic. Uh, Lynn touched on the um, community housing um, rent. I've got a scenario here. Um, if a lease has been renewed, in May 23 for six months. Does this mean on the renewal, there's no rent increase allowed until May 2024, or can I increase in November 2023 at the yeah. six month mark? Uh, so as the as the legislation stands currently, uh, it would need to be 12 months um, until that rent amount could be uh, increased. So that would be May 2024. And on a, just on the same vein, there's a question around uh, if a uh, tenancy ends, um, less than you know six months mm -hmm. or around that six month mark what's the situation with rent increase if I'm starting a new lease at that point yeah so as again we can only really talk to what the legislation is at the moment we know there's some proposed changes but as the uh, as the legislation is at the moment if it's a brand new tenancy and all of the previous tenants have moved out um, then in that case there, there can be an agreement um, for uh, an increase in the rent at that point, but it has to be all brand new tenants, none left from the previous one. Fantastic. Now, I know we did touch on this, uh, and one of the frequently asked questions was around this, but just to confirm, 
um, around latches. So I've been asked what the definition of a latch is. We've been asked um, if uh, it already has security screens, uh, is a lock required? Hmm. Um, what about if there's fly screens only? Um, so just to, if we can just uh, reconfirm uh, some of the information. Yeah, there. no worries. Um, so this is this is minimum housing standards and, and minimum is obviously the key word there. Um, security screens, fly screens are not mentioned in the legislation, although they may very well be a, a really good idea. Um, they may be very useful, but there's not a requirement under the legislation to meet these minimum housing standards to have a fly screen. Um, as for definitions of, uh, of locks or latches, the, the regulation just says a functioning lock or latch, and it all ties into the property needs to be reasonably safe and secure, which it's always needed to. This is just um, specifying a little bit more on how you go about that. So it doesn't say that um, you, know, you don't need a lock or a latch on the window if you've got a fly screen potentially depends on the type of fly screen, but ultimately the legislation says a functioning lock or latch. Fantastic. Um, specific question here, I suggested we wouldn't get into specific questions, but if a toilet's not working, but the tenant has a second toilet, I think this is around probably the emergency repair aspect of things yep. and what constitutes an emergency as opposed to a routine repair. Sure. Um, so a toilet's broken. Um, a toilet, a broken toilet is is defined as an emergency repair under the Act. Um, it doesn't say that, you know, it doesn't stipulate that it's only an emergency if it's the only toilet that you've got. So it still counts uh, as an emergency repair under our Act, but potentially the, the impact um, is lessened if they have another toilet, but it is still an emergency repair. Fantastic. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, around body corporate. Let me just reconfirm. I did drop the link into the chat. Um, so around um, the body corporate webinar that we did, um, but obviously there can be some concerns around where repairs sit and whose responsibility. Yeah. Um, so ultimately we can talk to the tenancy legislation. Um, there is a requirement to have a copy of body corporate bylaws. It can get a little bit murky at times as to whose responsibility it is. But as a tenant, you know, you follow your um, tenancy process. It may be issuing a breach notice potentially to the agent or the owner. Um, and there may be uh, other scenarios. If it's a bit complex, I'll probably recommend giving us a call. Fantastic. Um, all right. I think from a series of questions i think we've covered the main topics that we've come got in here um and i'll let you finish off lynn thanks Matt. i'm just conscious um everyone there's a lot of questions there i know that while we have covered a lot um if we haven't got to yours specifically keep in mind that a couple things just to um summarize here Sam has said quite often in the question site, it's about its minimum standards, right? So you need to look at each property needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. And if, again, the main purpose here is security, reasonably safe and functionality. So they're the main key areas. Um, the other part in relation to rent increases, I see that there's a lot of um, questions around that. Can I suggest going to our website? We have some frequently asked questions and we also have some further information. Um, a copy of this webinar, if you did look at taking notes and you missed a few things, a copy of our webinar will be available on our website by next week. So please keep an eye out for that. If you do need to just run past things again, um, there will be information there. Now, before I finish up, I just want to let you know there is a quick survey that's going to pop up after the webinar finishes. We'd love you to take that short moment to complete that. Um, two short questions, and we'd like to know what sort of topics you would like to know more about. Remember, our website has a lot of information and resources available to help you, um, and particularly to navigating not just the start and the end of a tenancy, but what things that might actually occur during a tenancy as well and what processes you need to follow. Our contact centre, our fabulous friendly staff in our call centre, is available Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 5, excluding public holidays, on 1300 366 311. So feel free to reach out to them as well. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mark. And again, everybody, thank you for attending today's webinar. And on behalf of the Outreach and the Education team, we look forward to you joining us again for another webinar or see you in person at one of our face-to-face -face events.
thanks everybody and the webinar will now end.